The job of the blender is to combine these elements in such a way as to produce an overall flavour. A wider repertoire of different beverages than ever before. I think one of the most interesting breweries and certainly one of the most interesting origin stories for a brewery in Australia. Single malts, blends, grain whiskies, bourbons and more. If you want their style to be sold around the world, then unfortunately you're going to have to make a compromise. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Chuck Hahn is one of very few brewers to become a household name among beer-loving Australians. But in contrast to other names like Cooper or Foster or Tui, which have been associated with brewing since the 19th century, the Hahn phenomenon is relatively recent. It's still playing out today. That said, few of us fully understand how an American with a PhD in chemical engineering came to be one of the most influential figures in the Australian beer industry. So when I learned that Chuck was celebrating 50 years of brewing in 2021, I was inspired to take a closer look at some of the events that have defined his remarkable career and become part of brewing folklore in Australia. I visited Chuck at the Malt Shovel Brewery in Sydney, and I spoke to many of the people he's worked with and influenced over the years, and slowly came together this documentary that I'm delighted to share with you on the Drinks Adventures podcast. He is one of the founders of craft brewing in Australia. It's the second biggest volume beer in the US, and Chuck had a significant role in that. If you think of a person who's created Hahn, created James Squire, created Kosciuszko, that's a pretty good pedigree for a single individual. There are a lot of people who are making beer today who are working in these independent breweries who are there doing what they're doing because Chuck had some input into it, you know? There's no denying that. Chuck Hahn was born in New York. And his father's army career meant he lived all over during his childhood years. But this particular story really begins in Golden, Colorado, where Chuck later studied at the Colorado School of Mines. The university happened to be situated across the road from the Adolf Coors Brewing Company. I had combined degrees in chemical engineering and petroleum refining. And so during the summers, I was working for the oil companies, working for Continental Oil, Conoco, and at their refinery one year and at their research facility down in uh, Oklahoma. And so they, of course, once I finished up my PhD, they wanted me to work for them in uh, research, petroleum research. But I really wanted to stay in Colorado. I was doing a lot of mountain climbing and skiing then. And during my time, my seven years I spent in Golden, Colorado, I was making frequent trips, of course, across to the Coors Brewery. They had a tasting room. You'd go there and just taste the beer and you wouldn't have to go on the tour. So we used to go over there and taste the beer and write up our, our lab reports. So I got very used to doing that. And I said, oh, that would be kind of good if I was able to uh, get a job here. And as it turned out, I was able to meet one of the, uh, one of the family, uh, Jeff Coors, and he was just starting up his research department with a pilot brewery and everything else, and I convinced him he needed me to help him sort up his uh, brewing research. So I started off in quality control and brewing R&D back in 1971. Chuck's time at Coors had him well equipped for his future entrepreneurial endeavors. In the 10 years I was there, I was able to get into all of the different areas of the brewery. It was great training ground for me. I mean, I, I worked a little bit in the waste treatment plant, worked in packaging, worked uh, malting company that we had. So I worked all around those different areas. Chuck's crowning achievement at Coors is likely the role he played in creating Coors Light. This is Mont Stewart from Molson Coors Beverage Company, as it is known today. So Coors had Coors Banquet, a very, very nice full flavoured beer, but it, it wasn't necessarily lower in calories that Miller Light was. So I think Chuck was one of a group of people who said, well, we should look to developing a light beer. So he got his team to go to work in the pilot brewery to do that. 
And so I remember talking to the Coors family, and one of the older Coors guys said, oh, I think it was, this was Joe Coors, I think. He said, Coors Banquet's already light. We already have a light beer. I said, no, we have to, we have to develop our light beer. I suspect there was a little bit of a political minefield. The marketing and sales guys were very keen to get a light beer out because they could see where their market was being challenged by a Miller Lite. However, the production guys who were traditional brewers preferred to continue producing the traditional beers. By Mont's recounting of events, as described to him by his colleagues at Molson Coors, Chuck enjoyed considerable influence at the company for someone who was only a few years out of university. Chuck, as they were developing these various formulations in probably 1977, he would fill up a little glass bottle of trial beer from the Pilot Brewery and he'd take it up to Bill Coors' office and Bill was the was the boss of the company at that time. And Chuck and Bill would sit there and taste these different formulations. And out of those sort of little private tasting sessions, Bill uh, was of the view that this is where we need to go. His mind was already made up because he'd had these private tastings with Chuck on the side, if you like. So we developed a new way of making a carbohydrate reduced beer that was revolutionary at the time. I've been putting up fence posts all day long. Hanson finally gets here and all he's got is light beer. Ever taste light beer? This is Coors Light. The surprising taste of Coors Light comes from pure Rocky Mountain spring water and high country barley. Not bad. Good. Really good. And a way of brewing that squeezes a lot of the calories out but leaves all the taste in. Hanson! I am surprised. Coors Light, the surprise is how good it tastes. The whole positioning on that was um, Coors Light with the real taste of Coors. Because like, like Miller Light uh, didn't have the same taste as Miller High Light. It was, it was modified, it was weaker in flavor. But we tried to match the same flavors almost. And that was part of the, of the success of that. It's now the second, second largest selling beer in America and has been that way for the last 10 years. How quickly did that happen? Ah, uh, just over over a year period. Yep, that that it that it took off. Yeah, it, and... it, it just took off, and then of course you know that's that's a long time ago to to have a beer that you've launched back in 1977 and have it now still being the second largest volume beer uh, in America is says something for the beer. It's the second biggest volume beer in the US. And Chuck had a significant role in that. Its volume is greater than the Australian beer market. Is that a sort of polite way to say it's a significant brand? Chuck left Coors in 1981 to take up a role at Tooth & Co Brewing Company in Sydney, Australia. I wanted to get into running my own brewery at the time, and Coors already had all their uh, operational uh, production positions filled, and so I, I, I didn't have a, wasn't able to move into the operations side as quickly as I wanted to. Back then, I was, uh, I was publishing technical papers, giving talks. I think that's one of the reasons I was actually recruited to come out to Australia because uh, Tooth and Rushes at that time were going through a massive modernization program and they wanted to bring someone out that was a leading brewing technocrat to make sure that when they finished they were able to make some good beers. So I was headhunted to come actually come out here as general manager of brewing at Tooth and Rushes. He spent two and a half years at Tooth, subsequently accepting an offer to join Lion Breweries in New Zealand. But all the while, Chuck had plans to launch a brewery of his own. So I spent three and a half years over there, but during that time, the last year, I was able to uh, have three Australian partners and a venture capitalist. We raised the capital in order to build uh, this brewery we're in right now, the Malt Shovel Brewery. What was the opportunity that you and your business partners saw? We just figured there was a niche there that uh, the imports weren't quite filling. People were enjoying Heineken and Becks and some of your German lagers, you know, uh, but not on tap, you know. And we figured there's a real niche there to have a domestically brewed premium European-style lager. But 
prior to us starting that up, I had been in New Zealand, I'd been watching very closely what Phil Sexton and the Matilda Bay Brewing Company had been doing in WA. I first became aware of Chuck when I was a young brewer working at Swan. And although the, the breweries at that stage in the country sort of didn't talk to each other in terms of competitiveness, they all had marked out their territories around the different states, there was still a bit of a, a brotherhood of, amongst the brewers across the brewing companies. And um, it was known to us that this young, young guy had uh, turned up at Tooth's from the U.S., and I think it probably was about a year later when we had a when we had an actual brewing conference in Perth when um, I would have first met Chuck, he came across for that. First recollection was that big smile and um, and the sort of still that lovely Colorado drawl, but uh, how incredibly fit he was um, to most people working in the brewing industry at that stage. It was at a time when young people weren't going into brewing for probably a lot of reasons. It was considered an old an old school type of craft and, you know, everyone was going off into computing and all these sorts of things from uni. And that's what piqued my attention when I heard that uh, this fairly young English chap had been up at Tooth. So it kind of felt like we were paralleling careers. Phil Sexton founded Matilda Bay Brewing Company in 1984. It was not long after we started putting our first brewery together that word came out of the East Coast that... Um, there was one being put together and, you know, that Chuck's name was involved. Another of the handful of small breweries already operating in Australia at that stage was the Lord Nelson in Sydney, which installed its brewery in 1986. Blair Hayden is the owner. He visited the Lord Nelson to check out what our little brewery was all about. We were brewing ales and Chuck is the lager king. And a little bit one-eyed about that, I've got to say, at times too. But you can't hate that. His passion has been enormous. Always happy to talk anything beer and uh, happy to talk over beer. And also very proud to be able to show you what he was doing when he opened up in Camperdown as well. The Hahn Brewery launched in Camperdown, Inner West Sydney, in March 1988. Its flagship beer was Hahn Premium Lager. We were going to call it Hahn Pilsner, but at the time people didn't know what a Pilsner was. And we didn't have enough money to educate them about what a Pilsner was. We called it Han Premium Lager. Yeah. And then we had a Han Premium Light, which was about 2.7% alcohol beer. Phil Sexton says the background that both he and Chuck had in working for the bigger brewers was unique among craft beer startups in the 1980s. He's an experienced brewer and was, was right at the start. So whatever Chuck was tackling was going to be done really well and uh, that was great for craft brewing. You know, there were a lot of other craft breweries starting up maybe in the mid-80s where, you know, they just did not have the technical background or the connections to, to pull it all together. You've got to remember there was, there was no internet then and even textbooks were almost impossible to obtain and that's partly because it was never encouraged by the big breweries because it sort of helped their competitive position. Cooper's Brewery Managing Director Tim Cooper says it was nevertheless a very challenging time for anyone to consider launching a new brewery. There weren't so many craft brewers in the 1980s and, of course, unfortunately, a number of them got into financial difficulty. In the 80s, uh, James, um, there'd still been quite a lot of ownership changes amongst the um, main breweries. And so, you know, you went from a time in the early 80s where everyone was very parochial, only drinking the beer that was brewed in their state, to having those parochial boundaries broken down by Bond and Elliot um, as they expanded their empires. And then the other aspect of it was the fact that the big breweries used to have control of a lot of the pubs uh, up until the 80s as well. The budget of 88 destroyed a lot of these small breweries because what they did, they had the regular excise level that you paid. Then on top of the excise, you had a 20% sales tax on your wholesale price. And then on, you even had a, a, I think it was a 7% license fee. You had to pay on top of that. We were actually, since the cost of our, our cost of manufacture was higher, we were actually paying the government more in taxes than the large breweries on a per liter basis. And so that's why a lot of these small breweries that started went out of business. It was really tough for them. The odds were stacked against the Hahn Brewery from the beginning, and things were about to get even tougher. And the first thing to say is that the accounts do show that Australia's in a recession. The most important thing about that is 
that this is a recession that Australia had to have. Obviously, it was difficult financial uh, circumstances for Chuck and for us. We nearly went bankrupt in the early 90s ourselves with the uh, recession that we had to have. Our beer volume in 1990 was 18 million litres. And by 1993, we dropped down to 11 million litres. People just couldn't afford to pay for our product. We were only surviving uh, from a financial point of view because of our home brew. Look, Chuck had a lot on the line. He had his house. He was up to his eyeballs in it. Doug Donnellan joined the Hahn Brewery in the late 80s. There was myself, um, there was my brother Matt, and um, also John Peter, who works still works for Lion. We were the three shift brewers at the time, and we worked around the clock to keep that brewery operational. There was a real love for the job. At that time, to actually be a brewer in a company like that um, was pretty special because there were a lot of people at the time who were looking at the industry and were aspiring to become uh, professional brewers, you know. We worked really hard and, and everyone worked and pulled together really well to try and trade out of the situation we were in. We were just uh, just trying to make, make money, with yeah. what we do, and we were just barely breaking even. And we were paying the banks 17% interest on our overdraft. One of the get out of jail um, ideas that we had was we introduced Sydney Bitter into the market, which was a budget brand. We'd been making 100% more beers up until then, but it, it had um, cane sugar in it. It was a very different beer from the beer that we had been producing. But when you make that product, a $20 case of beer, you've got to make a lot of it. And even when you're making a lot of it, there's not much money in it from the margins point of view. Uh, ATO, we had to pay excise. So day after we shipped beer out of the brewery, I'd have to go down and give them cash. And then eventually I'd get paid from my customers. And also at that time, these small brewers couldn't have a uh, retail license. You had to have just a wholesale license. So I had to sell to the pubs and then they would sell it on. Because you know, you sell a 50 liter keg for say $300. The publican sells that on yeah. and he gets $1,000 out of it. And he gets paid immediately. Chuck and other independent brewers such as Blair Hayden of the Lord Nelson went to Canberra to plead their case for reform of the punitive taxation regime. Chuck, uh, had, having a bit more money behind him than we had at the time, was able to uh, work with uh, with some influential people that got us the opportunity to put our case forward in Canberra and uh, discuss uh, excise on beer and our case as to why we thought it was exorbitant in such a small and burgeoning industry. And we were hopeful that they would see that it would be advantageous to encourage a small industry like ours. Alas, we weren't successful on that occasion. We talked to all the guys down in Canberra, but they, they, they just wouldn't listen to us. The banks just basically said, uh, we tried to negotiate loans with them and had them take equity in the business, and, and they just said, sign here, you know, voluntary receivership. To tell you the truth, I don't recall, never remember it actually physically seeing him phased by it. Yeah, he's a pretty cool character, Chuck. I think at probably once in the whole period or time that I've known him, I've ever seen him even lose his temper. And a lot of people came in and do the due, due diligence and trying to buy in. And finally, Lion bought in. Do you look back on that time and sort of think to yourself, gee, I wish I was five years later or <laughs> something like that, or you don't... I, I don't need to dwell on it. I mean, I've always yeah. been innovative. I've always been a bit of an innovative uh, disruptor. And, and we, yeah, we were before our time. I mean, we, we survived now. I mean, I can't, I can't complain. I'm gonna, uh, going on 75 now and still have a good lifestyle. And, uh, uh, know a lot of people, so it's a it's a great business to be in. Current line managing director James Brindley joined the business in 1994, the year after it acquired the Hahn Brewery. At that particular time, Crown Lager was uh, the iconic Australian premium brand, and and really, you know, ev every special occasion was Crown Lager. Uh, and then so Chuck, we'd had he'd done several evolutions of Hahn Premium and we finally got Harm Premium into the contoured bottle and it really, really took off. So it was a great feeling from us at Lion. We took it to a point where we were running 24-7 basically out of Camperdown to produce enough 
of this new Han Premium that came onto the market. And then eventually packaging went to Lidcom and um, I went out there and, and, and worked on a packaging line. I think it got up to three quarters the size of Crown Lager. Then of course in the uh, light beer battles, Han Premium Light, and then later on Carlton Cold come first, then we hit them with Han Ice. Uh, we were making it out at Tui's where we were freezing the beer in the tanks and then taking the beer off the ice and packaging it. And as a result, you get a slightly higher alcohol in it, level two, because you're taking the water out along with the polyphenols. But that was a real fad beer and it got to a couple percent of the market. It was amazing. The Hahn brand was enjoying unprecedented marketing investment under Lyons ownership. Actor James Belushi had an $800,000 payday for his appearance in this Han Ice commercial that was part of a $4 million brand campaign in the summer of 96 and 97. Sorry to bring you so far out of your way, but I just had to show you the view. <sighs> Sends a shiver down my spine every time. Then in 1998, Australian actor Michael Caton fresh from his career-defining role in iconic film The Castle, starred in this landmark campaign for Han Premium Light. Oh, now that's taste. How can one man have so much talent? Han Premium Light subsequently toppled Foster's Light Ice as the country's number one light beer. Then you have the low carb wars, pure blonde, then we hit them with Han Super Dry. I think Han Super Dry 3.5 was probably the, the first sort of modern era mid strength uh, and did extremely well back then. And then, of course, Han Ultra Crisp, which is the first authentic, real, legitimate gluten free beer. They did quite well, Lion, by buying Chuck's business because they got his name and his name's burn on a lot of stuff. I'm pretty sure that they never would have dreamed in a million years when they bought that little brewery down in Camperdown that it would be such a great business decision for them long term. And it has been, it's been brilliant for them. Because look at the guy they got for a start. He regards it more as a merger between Lion and, and Han. And when you consider that Chuck has been engaged by Lion to represent them at so many levels in terms of beer and brewing, it almost looks like a, uh, a reverse takeover from a brewing point of view anyway. <laughs> Tim Cooper there. The Han Brewery at Camperdown had become an important innovation hub for Lion, but it was costing the company to keep it open. The financial guys look at it, oh, it's costing us a million dollars. We'll save that if we shut it down. So it was all kinds of moves at the time to take the kettles out, shift them back to Tui's, and have it as a Tui's pilot plant. And I said, like, there's too much potential here. And so I developed a plan to start up a new brewery and call it the Camperdown Colonial Brewery. So I thought there was a niche for a, a, an English brown ale style. So I got approval to do that. And it was right after I got approval for it that I discovered the James Squire story. I said, beauty, you know? We then were able to develop that whole story of James Squire as Australia's first brewer, a convict brewer coming across and dying like 30 years later as one of the richest men in the colony. So it's a success story. How did you go about reaching out to the Squire family? Did you need to get their permission to do it? Oh, I, I felt I did. Yeah. Uh, I met a guy, uh, in fact, we still, uh, still see him on a regular basis, James Donahue. He really kind of was a communication tool to all the family. And I said, look, uh, Jim, I, I want to brew a beer in James Squire's honor, but I want to get the permission from all the descendants. My name is James Donahue, and I'm actually a direct descendant of James Squire, the original fellow. I met Chuck well, over 20 years ago, and uh, I'm just delighted to be associated with him, to be quite honest. And, and, uh, and I think it's fantastic that our illustrious uh, ancestor has his name attached to such a great range of beers. And uh, we've got a wider circle of uh, cousins coming to the fore. Oh, I'm not James Guy, and they've been very proud of it. 
we've got emails floating all around the place every day of the week uh, concerning uh, uh, James Squire himself as a character and, of course, the beers. So it's certainly a, a, a good medium for um, uh, popularising the, the family amongst the family descendants. We took some of his grandchildren, they were in their late teens or uh, early 20s, and had them come out to the brewery and we actually brewed some, had them brew some beer with us. Yeah. And we had a special release. It just adds to the authenticity of the brand of James Squire to have the, the descendants involved. The Hahn Brewery was renamed the Malt Shovel Brewery in 1998, taking its name from James Squire's original brewing tavern at Kissing Point on Sydney Harbour. Chuck tapped me on the shoulder and said, look, we're going to start up the Hahn Brewery again, Malt Shovel. James Squire, um, are you interested in coming back and being head brewer? So I, I, I had a choice at that point to stay at Lidcombe or go back to what I really wanted to do, and that was be part of a new craft brand. Chuck, Doug and the team at Malt Shovel were working under one key stipulation from their superiors at Lyon. They said, well, we don't want you to lose more than a million dollars the first year. So I think we lost $940,000 the first year. We broke even the second year. And the third year, we made a couple million dollar profit. Amber Isle itself did a great job because it was so different than what was around. We produced um, beers using American hops that hadn't been used before. Amarillo, it became the big hop in um, James Squire Golden Ale, which became the, the big beef um, for James Squire, which really put that brand on the map. You know? James Squire Golden Ale, never forsake flavour. We started to see more of Chuck and he took an interest in our specialty malts that we produced at, at our Ballarat plant. We met Mont Stewart of Molson Coors earlier on in this story. But when he first crossed paths with Chuck, Mont was a junior research scientist working for Joe White Maltings in Australia. And he'd come to us with ideas and say, oh, can you do this or can you get a malt that tastes a bit like that? And um, we had a, a plant manager at the time that liked that sort of challenge. This was an era when craft brewers had to use their initiative to get the ingredients they needed to make their beers. You wouldn't have shelves full of exotic malts from Europe and, and other places. So I think you probably did rely on your maltster and a couple of people who were, you know, liked the enthusiasm of a Chuck Hahn so much that you you do these things. You did it for a bit of fun as well, probably, frankly speaking, albeit that, you know, some of the brands that Chuck made obviously ended up into significant national brands. And to be part of that, that was a good thing, you know, really good. It's come a long way from us almost losing a million dollars in the first year with more trouble to becoming a multi-million litre brand around Australia. Former malt shovel head brewer Doug Donnellan there. All the while he was in Australia, Chuck maintained very close links with the brewing community in the US. Charlie Papazian is considered the godfather of home brewing and craft beer in America. I asked him when he first met Chuck. Oh, uh, I don't ex remember exactly. You know, he always seems to have been around <laughs> um, and involved with uh, helping us with judging the Great American Beer Festival, the World Beer Cup, and participating at our craft brewers conferences and, and before that time, uh, our microbrewers conferences. So we go way back. Chuck has judged beer competitions in the US since the early 1980s. He's had his fair share of success at the World Beer Cup, often referred to as the Olympics of beer competitions. When you have the Australian International Beer Awards, you can get a gold by just having a certain number of points. So it might be three or four golds in a category. When you get it in World Beer Cup, that means it's the best in that category for that year. And well, we've taken golds for, for our Pilsner, for our Swindler Tropical Ale, for our Porter, three golds. That's really quite significant. And he was very excited about that, you know, having been a judge to be acknowledged in blind tastings that his beer was... Uh, Worthy of all the talk. <laughs> the frequent visits to the US had other utility for the Malt Shovel Brewery back home. Hayden Morgan is Lyons Brewery Manager for Craft Beer. It would have been about 10 to 12 years ago. He started to bring American hops back to the brewers and they were making hop teas 
and then sort of understanding, you know, which one's going to go better. And that was the sort of the birth of the hop thief, right? One of Chuck's great lines was the art of innovation is copying quickly, tongue in cheek, of course. He'd always be keen to see what the brewers were up to in the States and he'd say, right, well, we could try that back at Malt Shop or Hahn or whatever it was at the time. Lion craft development brewer Rob Freshwater speaking there. In April 2009 came the inception of Chuck's next brewing venture, the launch of the Kosciuszko Microbrewery in the Banjo-Patterson Inn at Jindabyne in the New South Wales Snowy Mountains. Lion's James Brindley again. People say, well, what was the business model we followed to develop Kosciuszko? I went, well, Chuck bought an apartment in Jindabyne and said we should put a brewery down there. And I said, good idea. That was the model. It's quite convenient for us to go down there once a month, put some brews through, talk to the locals, uh, do some skiing, do some fishing. It's a tough life down there, you know. Kosciuszko Pale Ale is now a four million litre brand for Lion. It's made some inroads into places where you would never expect to see it. Because I remember walking into a bar in Brisbane, and Brisbane was a bit of a beer desert for a long time. And then I walked in and you can see all the lion beers lined up along there and all the Carlton beers lined up along there. And the one tap that stood out to me was there was a Kosciuszko sitting in there and I thought, this is incredible. Like, how does he do it? By 2008, 20 years after Chuck launched the Hahn Brewery, the craft beer movement was finally gaining serious momentum. We've previously explored the achievements of Stone and Wood Brewing Company in a documentary episode back in season two of this podcast. In Sydney, meanwhile, came the arrival of a swathe of small breweries in the vicinity of the Malt Shovel Brewery. One of them, Wayward Brewing Company, set up shop literally across the road. Its founder is Peter Phillip. I just kind of wandered over to uh, Malt Shovel and, and walked in and had a chat with him about what we were doing and showed him our plans. And he was stoked. It was really, I guess, the beginning of a, a great friendship, I think. The day we got our equipment, Chuck and Josh and a few other brewers from Malt Shovel were over very early in the morning, and they brought their forklift over. They were there the whole day. It was crazy, right? They had work to do, but that's just, I guess, the kind of guys they are. In 2012, Chuck and Malt Shovel helped found the Craft Beer Industry Association, which started out with the ambition of growing craft beer in Australia regardless of who owned the companies behind the brand. We supported that very much with my time and financially. Of course, we paid higher membership fees than everyone else, but we helped support it and got it going And because I felt there was a need for that. Uh, I was very careful not to take any leadership positions because I knew that that could get a lot of the small brewers upset if it was at all. Chuck Hahn is the president of that, and he's also involved uh, with Lion, but I was a very much a, a working partner in that group for a number of years. But by 2017, the market was changing and there were moves by some of the CBIA's independently owned brewery members to break away from the multinational owned brands. Seeing that the writing was on the wall, Lyon announced its resignation from the CBIA in an impassioned statement by Chuck. We believe it is short-sighted for the craft sector to be squabbling amongst ourselves, he said. We should be working together to build craft in Australia rather than confusing beer drinkers into thinking ownership structure has any impact on the quality of what they're drinking. And then, of course, when we were kicked out, it hurt a little bit. But what really hurt is when some of them came forward and said, look, if you're not independent, you can't make good beer. If you're a big brewer, you're just about mass production and you can't make good beer, good quality beer. I took a personal offense at that because I think at that time and still now, that uh, the larger breweries bring a certain discipline from a quality control standpoint and from an engineering standpoint that enables them to make consistent, high quality beer. I did feel for Chuck, because I know he inspired a lot of people to become brewers and helped them when they were brewers. You know, we had a lot of conversations around it. I remember him ringing me about it and talking about it because he wanted to, me, obviously, to talk to them about saying they were doing the wrong, the wrong thing. but. You know, at some point there was it was time to try and I suppose mirror what was what had happened in the US and put a line in the sand and try and create an, an independent brewing association, I suppose. That was Bent Spoke Brewing Company founder Richard Watkins. Waywards Peter Phillip is the current chair of the Independent Brewers Association, which superseded the CBIA. 
you know, it's bittersweet, right? Because it allowed us, I guess, to be the masters of our own destiny and really advocate for small brewers. Whereas I think that was the rationale was that big brewers and small brewers don't really have exactly the same uh, interests at heart. And, um, and I think that was the rationale. But look, you know, Chuck and I have talked about it. He's not bitter about it. I mean, he realizes that. I think his heart was always in the right place and was always very helpful and always very constructive. The idea of the craft beer revolution, you know, revolutions are always against the existing order. And when you look at revolution in beer terms, the existing order was the, you know, lines and the CUBs. And, you know, craft brewers saw anyone that worked for the big brewers as a sellout and automatically lesser than I think Chuck deserved to be regarded. Brews News Editor Matt Kirkegaard speaking there. In May 2021, 32 years after Chuck and Blair Hayden made their case for excise relief in Canberra, the Morrison government announced a major increase in the beer excise tax rebate from $100,000 to $350,000. Phil Sexton says there is no doubt that Chuck's early campaigning laid some of the groundwork for this result. I remember him making call, impassioned phone calls to me to get on board with this, and um, I actually never thought he was going to get anywhere. <laughs> this was kind of like, you know, you're all in it and you're all paying excise. But no, he's, he's managed to pull that off. That's chucked to a T. Sometimes you need to plough the field before you plant the seed and then you need to wait for it to grow. And Chuck was certainly one of the people who was in that phase because they were the ones who were rattling cages. Chuck, you're turning 75 this year and yet you still seem to be very engaged with the business and still very passionate about brewing. What keeps you coming to work every day? Oh, I just think the kind of the excitement of it and uh, being able to create new things. I mean, I was brewing last week down at the Kosciuszko Brewery in Ginnabine and the next day I filtered and kegged 12 kegs of our new Kosciuszko IPA. In fact, I'll let you try some, we'll go back over the brewery later, but we dry hopped that and, and Whirlpool hopped it using some gin botanicals from the Wild Brumby Schnapps and Distillery because we wanted something to tie it back into the mountains. And so the, the mountain pepperberry is the key thing there and it, it flavors it. So it's just this creativity thing, I think, that keeps me in the business, uh, the creativity and the sociability of, of beer. He's over 50 years in the whole brewing industry and he's still as passionate as ever. You know, when you look at him today, he's still out there and he'll still be down at Cozzy brewing. If I've still got that sort of passion in a few more years, I'd be very excited. Hayden Morgan again. The Malt Shovel Brewery has an honour roll featuring the name of every brewer who has worked there and the Hahn Brewery before it, since it was founded in 1988. So Chuck's number one, so he obviously started the Harm Brewery and to have your number is a you know, great sort of connection to the brewery and obviously the tradition that runs through there. Rob Freshwater, also known as Freshy. I think I'm 14, at best guess. I think Pete Merrow's 13, he, he sort of started at the same time just before me. My name's Alice McDonald or Ali Mack and I am the head brewer at Malt Shovel Brewery. I'm 59. I love looking at the Brewers Honour Roll and seeing all the names that have been there previously and how far back some of the brewers who we still have are on that roll. And there's been, when I've gone through the roll call, like it's there's been people I'm like, oh, I didn't know they worked here at some point. So it is really lovely to have that history. Because I talk about all the things I've done, but I, I really haven't done it. I've done it through people. I mean, I've had a really good team. I've had really good support from all the people working for me, all the people uh, and the people above me, you know, just supporting me in this, which is uh, impossible to do as a single entrepreneur. You just can't do that. You need support from below and from above. In brewing, it's, it's always a, a team effort. January 96 was my official starting date, I think. I actually first met Chuck probably 89, 90 or whatever. I was a keen home brewer at the time and I went to the brewery as a bunch of home brewers and of course we all idolised Chuck at the time because he was like the guru, you know, he was doing something different from the mob, beer with flavour and all this sort of stuff. So he had that sort of drive, passion, 
that's just unmistakable. It's engaging. I don't think it's too much to say that a lot of the, the craft brewers in Australia uh, got their training uh, from, from Chuck. And, you know, that's the, a beautiful thing about Chuck. He's, he's all about beer. Happy to bring someone in and train them and, and even happier when they go off and do their own thing. He's great for Lion. You've got to be able to tolerate ambiguity and, and let people like Chuck do what he does because people, people like that are awesome for bigger companies because it, it keeps us grounded and it keeps us in touch with what real business is all about. I was probably a, a going to be a pretty good brewer anyway, but um, working with Chuck really put a level of refinement into that because the way that uh, he trained us was to be very thorough. You were really brought up to be good at the craft. Ben Spokes Richard Watkins first encountered Chuck while working on the packaging line at the Hahn Brewery. I remember him sort of saying, you don't realise how important it is to scrub those floors and keep everything clean, and especially when the bottle filler had finished and people got handed out toothbrushes to go and brush the filling heads and stuff like that. He was very particular about making sure everything was really clean, and I was doing a bit of home brewing at that point, so that was probably the thing I took away, and I started being a lot more clean and sanitary. The two developed a relationship when Richard started making a name for himself at the Wigan Pen Tavern and Brewery in Canberra. Winning a few awards early on, you know, Chuck used to go skiing all the time, so he'd always drop in and say hello and stuff, and he'd always still say, um, oh, looking nice and clean in here, doing a good job sort of thing. So, And he used to always stay and have a couple of beers. He'd always be talking about how this is really good malt and, you know, this beer needs more hops or whatever it was. It's usually more complimentary than the negative, which was good. And he'd always bring a few of his beers and we'd talk about those and stuff. So I learned a fair bit having those conversations with him. You know, when you're tr trying to do something for the first time and you have someone who's who knows what they're doing coming, you know, sort of just talk sort of socially with you, I guess, you learn so much. Chuck always took an interest in people and he was enthusiastic. He asked people's opinion. There's plenty of people who actually don't do that. And this has gone on through his whole career. To have a guy like Chuck supporting you, you don't forget that type of thing, you know? One of my favourite things to do with Chuck is to watch him put together a recipe because it is just astounding to see that 50 years of knowledge just all come together and hear him talk about different interactions of different hops working together and whatnot. But what I love is that he's also just really respectful of everyone's opinion and wants everyone's input. He was on the frontier of, uh, of bridging the gap between uh, the most novice of amateurs and the most technical of professional brewmasters and everything in between. He could have a, a relevant and engaging conversation with an amateur home brewer, or he could have the same relevant engaging conversation with the CEO of one of the, some of the largest brewing companies in the world. Charlie Papazian again there. Brad Rogers is co-founder of Stone and Wood Brewing Company. His love and absolute passion, and I know it's an overused word, but he just loves it. It's in his blood. He can sit and talk to anyone across the length and breadth of brewing. You know, you don't have to be a brewer. You can be anyone off the street who's just got an interest in beer and he'll be able to talk at that level to everyone. Talk to a couple of my colleagues, um, Dr. Doug Stewart, who's our maltings manager, and also Nick Sternberg, who you know, uh, who's our operations manager and fellow brewer. You know, when I ask both Nick and Doug, what's their view of uh, Chuck, they both quickly said that he has always been generous in spending his time with other brewers talking about beer and brewing. He'll be regarded as someone who was the father of craft brewing and who has encouraged so many younger brewers to get into brewing. He is one of the founders of craft brewing in, in Australia and you know, we don't claim that alone. There are a few of us together. So I think very clearly one of the most important founders. Secondly, but even more overwhelmingly, I think, is, is inclusiveness. I've never felt like there have been secrets or, you know, I'm not disclosing this or that for various reasons. So he's, you know, always been incredibly open and his enthusiasm made people feel welcome, helped many people, reminded us that it's fun and 
you know, it's probably immeasurable how many people have been influenced by that to get craft brewing to where it is today. That's a legacy. <laughs> The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links, and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.